Hi, everybody. Um, can, am I coming through okay, Alicia? Okay, cool. Yes. Um, wanted to say welcome to a special edition of our ongoing series, Popular Music Books in Process. Um, it's a collaboration, as you saw when you got the Zoom link, if you're new for the first time, between Journal of Popular Music Studies, which I should say has a hot new issue out today, Uncharted Country, um, IASPM US, and the Pop Conference. So the three of us have Got, gotten together and every week we talk about a new book that's either recently been published or a work in progress. Next week in the series, I should make a note of telling you, our special topic is teaching popular music. So a new textbook by Eric Chari, a new and concise history of rock and R&B through the early 1990s and a work in progress, Rebecca Rinsema's Popular Music and Meaning in the Classroom. Those two will be combined and talking about their work and the general project of doing music textbooks. So that's for next week. But this week we are flaming. And we are flaming with Alicia Lola Jones, um, an assistant professor in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at Indiana University, part of SEM, part of AMS, part of the music and religion section and SEM liaison, a connected person. Um, um, the key thing is, author of a book that people are already entranced by, Flaming the Peculiar Theopolitics of Fire and Desire in Black Male Gospel Performance, newly out on Oxford University Press. Congratulations. And we're very much looking forward to talking about that book today. Um, a book that breaks ground by analyzing the role of gospel music making in constructing and renegotiating gender identity among black men. Uh, for today, in a, for our series, Unprecedented Fashion, um, she has assembled a stellar panel. Um, I will not be able to say all there is to say about all these folks, so I'm gonna say it quickly. Um, Mark Anthony Neal joins us from Duke, where he chairs the Department of African and African American Studies, uh, author of books like What the Music Said and Looking for Leroy. Fridara Mareva Hadley, uh, recently relocated to Juilliard School, I believe, uh, uh, moving from Oberlin, an ethnomusicology professor focused on Shirley Graham Du Bois and notions of musical Pan-Africanism. We've got Jeffrey McCune here from Washington University in St. Louis, professor, associate professor of African and African-American studies, women, gender, sexuality studies, author of Sexual Discretion, Black Masculinity, and the Politics of Passing. And then to start and end the show, we also have singers with us today, which is an amazing thing. Um, Countertenor and Music City native Patrick Daly, um, who has appeared with symphony orchestras, with Aretha Franklin, with um, all sorts of folks uh, live and, 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 and on film. Um, and, and Michael Kilgore, black and queer singer, songwriter, actor, and activist, who's been seen and heard on The Wiz Live, Broadway's Motown the Musical, and on tour with India Ari and with a debut album, A Man Born Black. Um, I think that is everything. Alicia, is it okay to pass it along to you? Yes, yes. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you for allowing us to have this time. And I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Kira Gantz, who will be setting the atmosphere. Yes, good afternoon or good local time, wherever you may be coming into the call. I am, I'm, I'm honored and privileged to be here. Um, I was among those who wrote a blurb on the back of the book. It's a beautiful cover, Flaming. And I'm going to uh, read from my blurb. I don't think my entire blurb appeared on the back, so I'm gonna read from a larger version. And then I'm gonna read from the opening chapter, which is titles, Setting the Atmosphere. Um, this remarkably rich, multi-sided ethnography of gospel music is praiseworthy in every hill and valley of its analysis. Jones has her eye and ear on African-American men's studies of music. Um, coming from the word of faith tradition, her book forges rigor and nuance that decenters the heteronormativity of quote unquote muscular Christianity in male-centered music worship. Every perception of black men in gospel music is queered but never burned by her analysis. This book offers readers and its subjects 
a redemptive loving kindness. Scholars interested in music from every discipline and denomination of study will find themselves in this text. Uh, and they will be aflame by the outstanding fusion of intersectionality, queer sexualities, and its inclusive gendered body and sonance from the Black men in the contemporary music ministry, some of which we will hear today. Um, this is a fabulous book. It's a fun book for me because um, I don't think I've ever read an ethnomusicology book or any other book uh, about Black music that talks about, and this is from the glossary, um, We've got uh, anal play. Um, we have uh, compulsory heteronormativity. Uh, this is all just from the glossary. We have, it's uh, my other favorite. Okay, flaming, in case you don't know the definition, a pejorative term to describe a demonstrative feminine masculinity. And uh, musical bottom, not to be confused with sexual bottoms, but musical bottom, the musical or sonic assertion of submission or sultriness through the demonstration of faculty and lower frequencies depending on the context. This is a beautiful uh, book about music, sound, and culture. And so I thought I would open with just uh, from page 16 and 17 of the book of a brief genealogy of gospel, gospel musicians' queer sexual history discourse. Uh, so this is the perfect passage in my mind for the moment that we're in. Um, there have been numerous events that have fueled the flaming choir director stereotype as a trope for queer possibility. As the HIV AIDS pandemic swept through the United States in the 1980s, the virus was associated with the sexual activity of men who have sex with men. Consequently, people's sexual behavior has brought into the public sphere, especially into historically black Pentecostal churches that disapprove that disapproved of same sex relationships. I do observe a correlation between vocal musicians, probably preemptive self disclosure and anxieties surrounding the wages of sin being brought about through HIV AIDS related deaths. Christian believers who were infected with HIV AIDS through various forms of sexual intercourse blood transfusion, or intravenous drug use, fear the stigma that was overwhelmingly associated with the disease. Pardon my, I'm tripping over my tongue. However, Black Christian believers were not on the forefront of getting education about the virus. Okay. They were not on the front forefront of getting education about the virus or how to serve those who were affected or infected by the disease. Countless believers died in shame. However, it has been musicians' disclosure of their private, I'm sorry, yeah. However, it's been musicians' disclosure of their private lives over the last 35 years that has brought to the fore the anxiety of the black church about sexuality and queerness. And I think that's a wonderful way to set the atmosphere for this wonderful um, deep dive into flaming we're about to experience. So welcome everyone. And I will pass the mic to my colleague. I think it's, is it Mark? Is he next? Patrick. Patrick okay. Daly to Patrick Daly for the sermonic selection. Well, hello everyone. I'm trying to keep myself from being too churchy, but um, it's so, uh, so such an honor and privilege to be before you this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are. Uh, and so, I always, as we're uh, setting the atmosphere and having and preparing to go into things, I want to just, you know, honor the ancestors uh, and remember the ancestors who are also our angels and our guiding, and our guiding light and our, our protection in many, many ways. So I pray that this is a blessing. Oh. Oh, night. Oh, 
Thank you, Dr. Gant, for setting the atmosphere, uh, the title of the introduction of the book, and uh, for the sermonic selection, if you will, by Professor Patrick Daly from Tennessee, Tennessee State University, one of my longtime collaborators, both in academia, <clears throat> excuse me, and in ministry. Um, well, today my hope is to share with you all um, a musical tradition that I love, I adore, and uh, that I think is so ripe for deep musical analysis. I do so as a, a church girl, a choir girl, someone who is formed in, respects the tradition, and also understands its nuances. Um, there's so much, obviously, I could say about the book um, as an expert, maybe, on the idea of flaming. But today, I choose to start or to enter the conversation um, by sharing a little bit about uh, my street credibility as a gospel practitioner. So um, I talk a little bit about why the research. There are several people uh, that have struck me over the years um, that have inspired me. But one in particular I want to introduce you today is um, Eric Terrain. Eric Terrain was an important figure in Washington, D.C. in the 1990s, and he was a proud alum of Howard University, uh, their music community there, and also a part of the colony of musicians that frequented churches like Metropolitan Baptist Church. Um, in Washington, D.C. And those who know of Richard Smallwood and Nolan Williams, you know of Metropolitan Baptist Church. He was um, uh, uh, at the Washington Performing Arts Society in the early 90s. And as you'll find out in the book, he was one of several folks who were thinking about how music might be a way to um, uh, reach young people during the surge in the crack pandemic in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, in 1995, I had the opportunity to do like my first for real audition uh, for the Washington Performing Arts Society's Children of the Gospel. 
And that audition absolutely changed my life. The access to music education, public arts education through what was then called the Washington Performing Arts Society um, put, placed me into relationship with people who are still my friends and whose careers have blossomed. So I wanna show you a little bit of footage, maybe be a little bit vulnerable to show you where I come from. And um, yeah, and give you a sense of the, the musical uh, tradition uh, that I was formed in. So let's see, this is show and tell. Okay, sharing screen. I'm only gonna show you a little bit of uh, engaged and demonstrative performance, but this is the Children of the Gospel at Alfred Street Baptist Church uh, in uh, Virginia under the direction of uh, Thomas Dixon Tyler, one of the directors that Eric Terrain um, employed in their seasons of the Children of the Gospel. Let's take a look and listen. Oh, and by this time, we have marched. right here of course I could keep going on and on and on but this is the gospel music of my youth and being able to participate in uh, their musical programming placed me in contact with people like Richard Smallwood, Nolan Williams, Walt Whitman, uh, Stephanie Mills, Daryl Coley um, but it also shaped a whole generation of musicians among whom are Leah Clark Lewis, uh, who is a, a famed uh, worship leader, Solomon Howard, who has debuted at Metropolitan Opera, um, people like Eugene Scott, who is a CNN correspondent. We are Eric Terrain's musical progeny. Um, and it was his story that you'll see in the book of how he passed and the way that he uh, was outed through his obituary because of presumptions of how HIV AIDS is uh, contracted that really challenged me as his musical progeny to bring honor to uh, his legacy and to shine a light on the ways in which men like him have been involved in our musical development. So right here, I will stop and um, open up to uh, Dr. McCune and Dr. Hadley, um, who are going to help the rest of us as panelists um, converse about some ideas in the book. So uh, McCune and Hadley. Um, thank you, Alicia. Uh, this is this is absolutely amazing, and um, it is a pleasure to be here. And you know. I, you know, somebody said they don't want to be churchy, but I, I feel there's no other way. Um, <laughs> so I'm in the spirit and literally uh, I feel the ancestors 
just, you know, you know, we talk about the ancestors all the time. They are here. Um, this is really a book uh, that we've been waiting for with such a rich mix of the theoretical, theological, and ethnographic richness sprinkled with so much tea. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's a lot of tea in here, and um, I'm really uh, glad to see it. Um, and I'm going to be, you know, two minutes just really giving a distillation of what I think um, is happening in this 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 really meaty work, right? So I'm not going to even claim, you know, I'm gonna let other folks do what they do, but it's meaty, and so uh, I'm just going to get in where I I fit in. I guess, I guess I'll say. Um, and thank you for bringing up Eric Terrain uh, in, the, in the text, but also just in life um, as a person who lived through these moments, right? Um, I also would like to say that these folks didn't just hit the church, they also hit the club. And so, you know, so the bachelor's mill, I remember folks, you know, many of the folks you named at the generator, the bachelor's mill, all these places. And so the, the, the real conversation uh, here between the secular and the secular and all of it being holy. So decades ago, Dwight McBride, now president of the New School, offered up a question, can the queen speak? A question that indexes Spivak's age-old inquiry toward the subaltern. His question was under the heavy archive, written and produced on the backs of queers, all while making queer folks abject. Under that archive, he was asking, could they breathe, speak, voice themselves? What would it mean to hear the queen speaking, the flame come alive, not for jest or even some faux justice, but in order to hear the dynamism of blackness and the queerness within? Here today, we have a text which allows the queen to speak. Many queens, flames, if you will, speaking through various articulations, the language of disavowal and acceptance. For me, there is something very important here about announcing the ways in which both the disavowal of queerness and the acceptance of queerness are generative and productive spaces within the church. The work that I do is always interested in finding how it is that we can even find the generative within what other folks call homophobic nonsense. And here, Alicia Lola Jones does that for us. The other piece of the text flaming that was really uh, moving for me was your positionality in the text, Alicia. The methodolog methodological ease with which you perform what I call the casual sexual ethnography. You know, I had to put a little sex in it. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> church don't like to talk about casual sex, but it's all up in that. So, you know, this casual, this casual sexual ethnography that you engage in, where we, ha we have these moments where the normative read is not rendered. You didn't just count, you didn't just count, count the church world or gospel world. Regina, can you mute? Thank you. Thanks, love. Um, you, know, you didn't just recount the, the church world or gospel world as we might imagine it informed by our hetero gazes. You gave us the tea, the truth, the thick descriptions. And it is this ease into the world of gospel production in the sonic, spatial, and textual which makes your queer informed voice a scholarly who it, a scholar who is serious about her shit. And, and you ring loud, right? In the ways that Erica Badu says, you know, you know, I'm an artist, I'm serious about my shit, right? There's a way in which you really make that clear in the way in which your voice becomes a queer informed voice. It is clear that Eric Terrain is talking with you. It is clear that Richard Smallwood is talking with you. It's clear that Daryl Coley and, and all these other folks and, and, and folks that you uh, cite are talking with you. And it is clear that you are an active, active, performer witness, what Dwight Carcagood calls, you are making the ethnographic performance of intervention. While I was so titillated by your own subjectivity and access to the gospel of the flame, I was also interested in how a certain queer reading practice may have also pivoted from readings which rightfully assess the work of the queer folk who don't want to be queer, dequeering through disavowal of sexuality alongside these falsetto and castrati voices. I often lean into the idea that the mouth does not have to profess what the singer's voice, its cadence, height, and register often pronounces. The erotic denied is the erotic supplied for a black queer churchgoer who wants to find his flame in the sea of holiness. 
in text and in sound. And so for me, it was really exciting to see you like engage, right, the ways in which, right, the text is, is opening up spaces for Derek Coley and others, right, to articulate uh, an eroticism that queer folks might see in the audience. But I also wanted this, this moment, right, and I, I think you do it a little bit, but I really wanted you to talk more about this moment of, of making the queer listener, the oral, right, experts, right, of queer voicing. Right, we've been listening to Sylvester all these days, right? And we're like, look, we know Sylvester, we know his tea, right? But 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 everyone was like, okay, you know, well, you know, maybe he's just, you know, this, maybe he's just that, or all these other singers, Luther included, right? We know Jason King, who I think is on the line, right, writes about this as well. So there was a lot there um, in this kind of dance between sound and text that I found really rich in the in, 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 in flaming. But there's also this last thing, and the last thing I'll say which is the offering here of how queerness, queer folk, whether out or not, produce a flame which transforms what we understand as the black church and its performances. For me, the transformative, or what I call transformance, is the productive dimension of what we know as a deep castig castigation of queer folk into a hell due to the heavenly experiences which frustrate those who hate so steadfast against them. So I just wanted to say, I am so appreciative of the rich ways in which you really textured the dynamic of the black church and these black men's voices in a way that I love what Kira said, it's not in a way that totally uh, dismisses them or doesn't love them. There's a tender care that you take with these men and with these artists and with the music that also shows you as a shaman, right? You yourself, right, are a shaman, and you have ushered into this world a beautiful gift. Thank you. Wow, wow, especially from someone who we are of the same ilk in terms of being multivocational, so it, it means a lot uh, uh, to hear that. Can I call you Reverend Doctor? <laughs> you can call me whatever you want today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the author of Sexual Discretion and whose book launch party um, launched me into Bloomington, yours along with Dr. Marlon <laughs> Bailey at um, E. Patrick Johnson's home, but it definitely set uh, the tone and the rhythm for, for my, my entrance into Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you. Should I, can I engage you? Dr. Haley, you want to go and then I come back or how do y'all want to do this? I'll just say this, uh, for the earlier part of your, your um, unlaying of, of, of implications of flaming, I will say that um, uh, chapter five is one way to enter into um, w uh, an imagining of a queer listening, uh, wired. Um, and I can't talk about chapter five without uh, bringing in the room ancestor Katie G. Cannon. Um, before whom I presented this research. And when I shared with her Wired and um, a sort of queer listening of this song by the artist then known as Tone, um, I was presenting it before the academic body, the Society for the Study of Black Religion. And the entire time, it was as though we were co-presenters. She spoke with me as I shared sort of how we might understand Wired as uh, Tone telling us who he was all along. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in short, um, he talks about, uh, uh, he gives praise for um, uh, not be, for being seronegative, mm -hmm. um, using a sort of formula of praise that we hear often in gospel music. Um, and so in walking through that, Dr. Cannon to me symbolized the sort of response of the church mother, the honored and revered um, person in our community who is connecting the dots about the coded musical, lyrical communication uh, that really is, um, it's discreet to use the term you have, um, you are an expert in, and it is artful how he brought us into his narrative. Um, so that would be one way of, of entering into a queer listening um, in an extended way in the book. 
Dr. Hadley. Um, good afternoon, everybody. This is church. Somebody say something. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. Um, Alicia, thank you for what you have offered us and you what you have called us to think about and examine. And the first comment um, I want to make about it is there is so much richness in what you offer us and to think about um, the community that you represent in the text. And in doing so, you have also written a book that is, um, in terms of ethnomusicology, a methodological exemplar, right, of how we should do um, and construct and build work that matters, but also is equitable for the people with whom we work and fosters community at every stage of the journey. Reading your text, and I've been fortunate enough to hear you present pieces of this and hear pieces of this over the years. And so it was immensely gratifying to hold the text in my hand. I told you my mama got a copy and Alicia was kind enough to autograph it for her. Um, but paying attention to the scaffolding that you build in order to share the truth that these men so generously shared with you, the care that you demonstrate in your methodology to do that is also inspiring because it represents exactly what Dr. Jeffrey was just talking about, um, your positionality as, and what you said in your introduction of the text as one who comes from this tradition, understands the nuances of it, understand what's at stake for people to share their stories and their lives even now, right, in 2020. And so as one like you, born and raised in the Baptist church, came up singing in youth choirs, church choirs, that's still in the Baptist church, that's my life, right? Um, I was watching for certain things and at every single juncture, you resisted the urge where one might choose the salacious or one might choose the um, lascivious you deliberately and explicitly spoke about making the better choice. And that is a choice that can only come from one who is equally dedicated to their position and their craft as scholar, but also fundamentally invested in the safety and the well being of the people with whom they work. And we all know that that is not always a given. And that was as. Um, emotional and breathtaking for me, as was the information that you were sharing with us. And so this book could, should be taught for lots of reasons, but certainly for the reason of how it displays the ethic of ethnography in a moment where lots of us are thinking about what are the ethics of ethnography. You have given us a prime example of how to ethically engage our collaborators, our community, our field in ways where everyone can walk away feeling good and proud and see themselves in the final work. And you continue in the event that we have today of including those voices in the platform that you have to share about the work, understanding that and sharing your work, you are obviously also sharing the work of, this, of the community in which you work. And so I just wanted to point that out and say that explicitly because I just found it um, really, really important and, and a, a loving act that occurred in your work throughout the book as well. Um, I'm also fighting back a little bit of emotion here because, um, again, I came from the same Black church tradition. And when you were talking about Eric Terrain in the book and today, and I've said this in other places before, I think we're only at the beginning stages of reckoning with what it meant to lose that generation of musicians. And you say this in the book as well, the Eric Terrains of the world, for me, it was Minister Lenny in West Palm Beach, Florida. They disproportionately took an interest in the young people of these churches and in these communities and spent their time, their energy, and their talent cultivating us as musicians, showing us that in a world that said we weren't worth anything, that we were. And so to literally watch so many of these men grow gaunt and waste away, but still bringing themselves into service, still bringing themselves into the choir loft, still bringing themselves and, um, up to the Hammond organ, um, and then only to have them pass away and we lie 
and we disrespect and we we do further harm to their to them and to their families in death right um it's something that i think we're only just now beginning maybe to be honest about right um and so that was really powerful for me and then the way that you kind of evoke the policy of the military don't ask don't tell right so we know these things we we are in these 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 churches and we're witnessing everybody understand some piece of what is going on but we were not speaking truth right um and i and i don't mean people who were made to be closeted. I mean, the rest of us, right? Because the onus isn't on people who are being uh, uh, um, um, preached against in the pulpit to put themselves in further harm. The onus is on the rest of us to tell the truth about life, right? Um, and the way that you do not let people off of the hook with the love the sinner, hate the sin rhetoric, the way that you call that out, right, um, was so powerful. And so I kept thinking about don't ask, don't tell, and you, you, you repeat it throughout several chapters in appropriate places. And I kept saying to myself, we must ask and we must tell. We must ask, especially um, since you're talking about these worship communities, who we desire to be, right, in these spaces. Are these spaces of freedom and of love, or they're not. There's not really any middle ground in that, theo theologically speaking. And you make that case very strongly throughout the book. That's one of the strongest themes, the sort of running hypocrisy that is not innocuous at all, but is painful and literally a matter of life and death. And one of the things that I think is so powerful about he, how you uh, insist on not conflating um, gender expression with sexuality and that is so critically important because, and you were, and you mentioned it in your book, um, when we were at Columbia for the Are the Gods Afraid of Black Sexuality um, symposium, which was incredibly powerful. Um, and the musician Donnie said that, girl, right? He said it was the church that turned him out, right? And you talk about that whole phenomenon of being turned out. And we, we as a church, these spaces, focus so much on the presentation, what we read as the presentation of queerness, that we completely ignore those who may be of a different sexuality, but present in what you call compulsory, compulsory hetero, heteronormative ways, um, they get this kind of escape all because the mannerisms are all right right and they present in a certain way and so it takes a lot of deafness to present all of those shades of interaction that are happening in the in the in these spaces everything that was just said about the listening that part was always so riveting to me how you would walk through an example of donnie mcclurkin's we fall down for instance but then say a queer listening of this however <laughs> Every one of those vignettes could preach on their own. And so I'm left, as I finish the book, thinking about, you know, um, the hope of this book, right? Um, and I do think your willingness to name things, this isn't salacious and this isn't, and there is tea in it, but it isn't about, you know, this person is this or this person is, that's not what it is at all. But in your care and naming processes, deliverance, rituals, the, the nuance that you bring to that, I left feeling hopeful about what this book can do to make it, make church spaces, life-giving spaces for everyone who chooses to enter them, that we won't have a repeat of the 1980s and what happened in 1980s with the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, that there is a way forward. You have given us language to employ, to be able to name and recognize a thing in a way that is not um, solely resting on meme culture and the sort of hyperbolic caricature of it all, but allows us to have progressive dialogue that makes these spaces a place where people can become free indeed. So thank you so much for what you've given us. Wow, thank you, Dr. Hadley, uh, for 
your your thoughts. Um, there's so much there. I I would say if I could choose something, um, one of the ways that I talk about the tensions is in chapter one, as you mentioned, this idea of deliverance, being delivered from homosexuality and becoming formerly or ex-gay. And while we talk about the Black church in the book, the Black church folks is always in quotation marks because there's no monolithic church, so the Black church. Um, I think it's also important to to ascertain that the anxieties and the tensions didn't just come out of anywhere, that there are also colonial ties um, to these anxieties. And so I do bring our interactions with Europeans and European Americans into this discussion about the, the sorts of scapegoating. And I mean that in the Hebrew Bible sense, that is the placing of sin upon a thing, a symbol, an entity, um, 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 that is also brought into the fore in understanding how these anxieties um, emerge into the Black church. But then also, the idea of deliverance isn't peculiar to the Black church. We've heard of the idea of pray the gay away, um, which would be um, popularized in white evangelical settings, for example, um, or these sort of uh, ideas of therapy where people can be neurologically, psychologically, sociologically changed um, to, at the very least, manage uh, their urges. Um, and so tackling that, uh, but how it takes a particular racial and gendered valence for African-Americans is what's at stake in this book. And even as we talk about Black men, there are ways that our ideas of gender and sexuality have implications for Black women. Um, and so thank you, thank you. Um, and keeping with the order of service today, <laughs> we have uh, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, who's going to do the altar call. The doors of church <laughs> will now open. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about Dr. Hadley referencing the, are the guards scared of, God's afraid of, of Black Sexuality Conference back in 2014. I don't know if Dr. Jones remember this. It, it was a lunch session, and it was myself and, and the OG Guy Ramsey, and we were talking with you about this project and you were just kind of laying out what it was, some of the pushback that you were getting, both in academic and religious circles. I remember sitting there thinking to myself, just being rather frank, damn, there's some dangerous shit she's talking about. <laughs> and when I was talking about it being dangerous, it wasn't just the danger that it represented within the black church, but also truth be told, the danger that it represented in terms of the main frame, the main line of black studies where we don't want to have these conversations. And part of what you did with this book, and, and this has also been borne out with, you know, Professor Hadley and Professor McCoon's comments earlier, is that this is an important work of recovery. Reading this book took me back to being a young graduate student in the early 1990s and watching Black Is Black Ain't and being introduced to, you know, the, the legendary Carl Bean and being mesmerized by his ministering and wondering who this man was that I had no idea that who he was, that I didn't know about him before. And doing little bits and pieces trying to connect the dots to realize that he was once a, a Motown recording artist who recorded a song called Born This Way about 20 something years before someone else would make it a top 10 hit. But he had to disappear from that legacy because of who he was. He recorded for the Motown label, which incidentally was the same label that recorded a group called the Dynamic Superiors, which who themselves were an out queer black soul singing group in the early 1970s with a great lead singer by the name of Tony Washington. And this is a group also from D.C., so there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in this D.C. area in the 80s and the 90s that we need to recover. And then to think about the work of B. Slade, 
the artist formerly known as Tone. I did a little project on Twitter about a week and a half ago asking people to choose between Frank Ocean and B. Slade, knowing that the majority of folks only know who Frank Ocean is and has n have no idea who B. B. Slade Tone is, even though B. Slade and Tone is immensely more talented and skilled and prolific <laughs> than Frank Ocean. And that's what we're talking about, the danger of not, us not being able to represent the best of who we are. That's what I loved about when I was first introduced to Carl Bean. Carl Bean was the best of who we were and are. The men that you highlight in this book are some of the best of who we are. And we do not only them a disservice, what we do ourselves a disservice by not honoring the gifts that they bring to bear in celebration of who we are. Wow, thank you, thank you. Um, I believe it's Bishop Carl Bean now. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I do have to, it, it comes to my mind to also shout out the women who captured these men's stories, uh, Lexi and Dr. Teresa Hairston among them um, because they were willing to engage in conversations uh, with men about taboo topics. I was able to retrieve interviews by people as they were passing like Pastor Daryl Coley. And so I give thanks for the women who are um, journalists, founding journalists um, and t television personalities who made this work possible. Um, that, event are all the, are the gods afraid of are all the gods afraid of black sexuality i mean we need to get yosef Surratt some more money to put that yeah, back together again absolutely. um because it was the gift that kept on giving um and you guys just brought it uh and as you said it was the moment of even having opportunity to spar with you and dr ramsey um that uh, uh, that was an amazing fall entering into Indiana, but um, it, it really did give me the encouragement to, to um, sit with these ideas. Um, and so true to our order of service today, we have a musical benediction um, by uh, what I hope to be a new collaborator, Michael Kilgore. He, like uh, Professor Patrick Daly, um, they're very uh, musically competent in religious and non-religious settings. I, I think he, he would describe himself as someone who uh, was raised in a PK like myself. I'm a PK, in, yes I am. <laughs> raised in the church and draws on the church tradition. He takes us to church in his, his musical prowess, um, but someone who um, through his musical recordings and his um, live performances um, takes the spirit with him um, and really is, is interested in, in engaging scholars around musical scenes and lives. And so uh, he, is, he has also consented to share with us uh, before we enter in Q&A. You ready, Michael? I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people on earth because I was around 14 years old when I feel like my family really saw me and my uncle was my pastor most of my life and he said to me I, a lot of people don't want you to be in the church I know you don't want they don't want you to be in the church because you would say but you've been released to the nations not just to somebody's church and I was 14 not knowing what that was what that meant um, but as I got older, I realized he was just saying the expectations of others is not what's really going to be important because what you're doing is so special and so integral that you're going to have to break some of these religiosity rules that you've been taught your whole life. Um, and because of that, it, it gave me the wind to go, I want to be seen. I don't want to be tolerated. I don't want to be seen through the veil i want to really be seen and if you want me and you want my art and you want my gift you got to actually see me um so on my latest album i wrote this song because i'm of the 90s and 
in my mind, no matter how nasty your R&B album is, you got to end it with gospel. You have to. Um, so my album is not quite that nasty, but I did want to end it with gospel. So this is my song, God and Me. You are so beautiful, so wise. I wish I saw the world through your eyes. I wish I loved like you so nice. You give so much, I wonder why. I look me in the mirror and I search to see where is the master's image staring back at me? Where is compassion or the need for setting free? I wonder, can God see the God in me? Ooh, see the God in me. These limbs, they seem to be so small. I wonder if I stretched, would they reach at all? If I could touch a hole or two, I'd lead those hearts I touched to you. I look me in the mirror and I search to see Where's the master's image? Staring back, staring back at me. Where is compassion or the need for setting free? I wonder, can God see the God in me? See the God in me. Open up my eyes to see the needs of others. Open up my life to my sisters and my brothers and then shine a light to help those in the darkness see God for themselves if we're in him and he's in us it should show if we're in her and she's in us then everyone ought to know if we're in God and God's in us because yeah. oh, God is love, can't you see God open up our eyes, open up our eyes, and then shine the light to help those in the darkness see God for themselves. I want you to see the God in me, hey, see the God in me, Ooh. can you see the God in me, I can see the God in you. Where is the prayer oh, call? Oh, I am oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Thank you, Michael. And here I want to affirm brotherhood um, and sisterhood. I want to affirm uh, Dr. Gaunt, Dr. Hadley, who out the gate said, if you have you want to talk about this, I'm there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mark, who also in the same way did that, knowing that I was trembling and shaking. And then the brotherhood of my collaborator, Professor Patrick Daly, who was one of the first people I did lecture recitals with, and then saying, I would like to also invite my brother, Michael. Um, this is the work that needs to be highlighted, that these relationships exist. This is the love that sustains us and nourishes us when we do the work, quaking and shaking and nervous like me, 
a girl from DC just trying to do something that's a little different. And so thank you for the family and friendship that you guys offer me. And um, I hope in what remains in terms of time, um, also Jeffrey, um, Dr. McCune, Lord Jesus, I mean, you, well, I, we cut up. It's just, you're my cousin. Like, I swear <laughs> we are related by blood. <laughs> Uh, but just the, the, the family that you all um, exemplify and not just the research and the mundanity of research, but the living um, through it all. Um, thank you. And so I suppose there's Q&A, Eric, I suppose. Um, uh, I know Calvin, my fiance, is po posting information for anyone who wants to connect in the comments. Um, and I look forward to any thoughts. I'll pass it along to Carl, who'll take over the Q&A, although I'll make a personal request that we hear at least once from Guy Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would, that would be a place to start. Um, there actually, there's, there's tons of great comments and, and links and things in the Q&A, but nobody's actually asked any questions so far. So, um, so if Guy Ramsey wants to speak up with a question, that would be a starting point. And if anybody does want to ask a question, um, you can just... Uh, say, hey, me, in the chat, and I'll call on you that way. Guy, any, any, any thoughts? Good evening. Hello, everybody. Hey. I, my question is, what, what key was that song in, man? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's just a little lower than glory. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quite in glory, but it's just, just a taste below it. And you know, in your prayer time, you'll get it. You'll get there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Alicia. Uh, what I love about the panel is that we see, of course, as uh, uh, Federa was talking about, this ethics of your work and working with different communities. I want to ask you: uh, Do you find that sense of of ethics in this particular work? Do you find it in other areas of the academy and the academy's work? Because we're praising you for good judgment and for sharing and for not taking advantage of people as if that should be something exceptional when we are uh, doing uh, academic work. Can you address that, please? Thank you. I'm going to think for a beat or two. It occurs to me that in this present moment, we as Black scholars are um, experiencing an unprecedented amount of engagement uh, about what it means to be Black, what it means to be doing many everyday and spectacular things. Um, and we are also noticing that as folks are trying to figure out how to engage people of African ancestry and people of color, women in the United States, that um, these issues are not being championed by the folks who are being um, examined, but rather people who are not from the community. And so here, I, I'm happy to take up the space as an insider, outsider. I'm happy to be seated. I'm happy to be acclaimed because if we look at the records, it's not often that it occurs in the broader academy. Um, that's the ethic of care, to give the laurels when possible. And I've been reflecting on this a lot um, with the recent passing of my father who said, don't wait for the academy. Um, you be among those who honor and you, uh, you treat the critique and honor alike. And so um, I'm okay with standing in it in this moment because again, um, this might be it. Thanks so much. I think oh, um, we do have a question from Zoe Sherman. Oh, sure. I think can. Sure, Ian. Um, so maybe, maybe you want to ask your question, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Hey, uh, well, I, I just posted it, but thank you so much, all of you, for an amazing presentation. And, and I, I so appreciate how you left us with a sense of hope and how this is a form of, of to me, a form of that you are creating liberation theology in this work. 
And I wondered if you could talk more about this action of redemptive loving kindness that someone articulated that way, but it's on, on the second to last page, 224, your reflection on the strategies by which believers may better excel in love. How has this ethnomusicological action been going for you? How have you noticed change, changes of heart in the community? Um, I, I realize that in some ways, just talking about the book is part of that process, but, but in the community itself, how have you noticed your work changing people? You know, where are they going and, and has it had musical resonance? Thank you. Um, uh, as I've, and thank you so much for your feedback um, uh, um, about the book. Uh, before today, um, I would say that in many ways, um, initially people cautioned me about um, what would be unearthed as I uh, embarked upon the research. Uh, family members um, were curious about, you know, the methodology, what we would call methodology or the approach um, and the motivation. Um, however, as folks have heard the titles of the talks and seen the invitations, um, they have noticed what could be provocative titles like Pole Dancing for Jesus. Um, they have noticed I Am Delivered, um, seeing the signifying that uh, um, is in the titles and what could possibly be salacious. Um, and also my self-identification as a theologian, a practitioner, a minister. Um, and so with the titles and this insider knowledge and then my positionality as someone formally trained to give care, um, there has been um, an accountability in doing the work and writing. And so I know that my mama from Eastern Shore, Maryland is going to read the book. I know that my former teachers will read the book. I also know that my, my really conservative faith community will want to know, um, have I got good religion? Certainly, certainly. And they will trust me to take them on a journey that will expand them and help them to have courage. And I will tell you, and I am not being hyperbolic, I'm not trying to <laughs> smooth it over. While people are nervous initially, I will tell you that for the most part, with the exception of one musician um, who outright was like, no, and I just think he didn't have the bandwidth to hear me out. For the most part, people actually keep the door open to converse. Um, the most conservative folks, e even if they initially shrug it off, I am thankful that people in general want to understand. And when I share with them that I want uh, the theological impetus, even though it's not a theological work, is that we be known by our love. That keeps folks in the conversation, that we aren't um, um, off-putting with our ignorance or um, off-putting with our terminology, that we don't exchange affliction for another when we're trying to heal people and deliver people. And when I challenge people in those ways, um, I have to give folks credit that they generally remain in the conversation. They might be quiet for a little bit. And I, in particular, pay attention to those of a particular generation who fit the profile in the book and who have invested their life long work in subscribing to these arrangements um, the way they have subtly called or sent notes and said, thank you just thank you. Um, and for those who feel anxious, um, there's another who actually is like, I see the effort you're putting in there. So um, in short, I want to give people a lot more credit. Folks, I don't think folks want to be off-putting at all. Um, at least that's the, the position I, and posture I, I do this work and beyond the book itself. I hope that answers your question. We've got time for a couple more, I think, and we have one from um, Antonio Randolph. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm um, well, and you? I'm good. Thank you so much for all that you have just already um, shared with us already. Um, 
uh, I had a question about um, writing about black. I, I study black masculinity and hip hop, um, and I was wondering how your positionality as a, I assume a female identified person, um, influenced the way the care you took, or how did that go into shaping the way you wrote about black masculinity? I appreciate that. Um, yeah. You know, keeping conversation partners um, along the way has been an important part of the approach. People like Patrick Daly, who, it, you know, it's weird when you, not weird, but it's, it's, it's a little anxiety inducing to present in front of the person you're analyzing. Um, but, um, and some would say, well, that might mute um, or sanitize your work. Um, I, for those who, for those who have read it and are not the objects of, of analysis, um, I, I give them permission to push back if they think that it is, um, veering toward a sanitized, um, analysis. However, even Patrick, and maybe you could interject here, I think he almost had an out-of-body experience hearing the analysis of who he is uh, <laughs> as a countertenor. And even now, when he looks back on his younger self, he's, he's talked about the growth in his identity and how he understands moving about in the world. Um, but I think it's important to keep when possible, the subjects of subjects of analysis and conversation, but then also have folks like outsider uh, queer men who are not black, but who hear and see the scene in a particular way. Um, I gesture toward them too, how they um, experience the scene or um, uh, the symbols in the scene as well. Patrick, do you want to add to this? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think that what you definitely laid out is exactly what it was. I will say um, that when Alicia, you know, kind of approached it, for one, we already had like a relationship of sorts, you know, through social media, through all those sorts of things. So we were very familiar with each other. I went to undergrad in, in Baltimore, I went to Morgan, so like knowing the DMV, so we were connected already through a lot of ways. And then, you know, also she's had a history of this kind of work. Like, like she's had like the genes from in conference and all sorts of things. So we kind of knew, like, oh, this is the girl, she down, she cool, she gets us. Um, all of us, you know, not just the, you know, just the queer, the same thing, the trend, like the, those along those lines, but all of us. Um, so when I started, and I think by the time I started with the, um, we got into the project, I, you know, I was, and the video that she references, that was still when I was in undergrad. I was still at Morgan. I was still in college. So that's like 2011. It's 2020. <laughs> Lots of time has passed. Um, and digging into it. And she also was key in sort of my own venturing into scholarship, venturing into the academic, you know, work. So I think that what she's already said, and I'm just kind of giving some, you know, some tangibles to it, is that keeping the partners along the way, making sure that I care when they say, and also having a really, just like a, a genuinely good relationship. Like we text each other, like, hey, what you doing? That's me, let's go, like whatever it is. Like the familial component is so key in trying to, because you know, we're like giving ourselves in many ways. And like, when you look at that, when you look back at chapter two, you'll see a very different Patrick. But those were very real concerns, right? For somebody at that age trying to navigate these spaces. So, you know, it is a tenderness. And, I, and, I, and I'm always big on, I'm, I'm a big on the black women because I love black women and black women have been the ones who've always been there for us, right? And held us down. And so I really feel like, you know, as you're going into your work, just being like, I got you, I got you home. It's going to be and being as real as possible about it. Like, I'm walking with you. I'm not, you know, and she's always made it feel like we were partners in this. Never felt like she's like a lead or I'm behind or what have you. Like, there is a, like, a real partnership. And so, those are the, that's just what I've experienced, you know, working with someone like that. And that is, to me, that's the pinnacle. Thank you.
If I may add to what you were saying, you mentioned Genius for Men, and I see Dr. Eldridge mentioned it. Um, do you pronounce your name Antonia or Antonia? It's Antonia. Antonia. Um, Genius for Men was actually uh, um, a public facing program that my sister and I started in Chicago following um, the untimely, well, the, the murder of a friend of mine in college. And um, I share that because it really sobered me about how Black men moved about campus at Chicago. Um, it's interesting to be called to that sort of public facing work where we use the arts to illustrate the narratives and then uh, meeting the mark in our community as a woman who in divinity school was also challenged by men about my uh, ministry because they were taught that to, for a woman to pursue ministry, it would mean something about her personal life. Um, and so I understand the complexity of how patriarchy and, and sexism and heterosexuality um, uh, can um, put tension on relationships between brothers and sisters. Um, however, I've had a community that has shown me other models of brotherhood and sisterhood. And so doing the work, um, I don't, uh, I don't change that. I, if I'm going to delve into his life, um, there are ethics in that. Um, um, I have a network. He is now part of that network as a colleague. Um, and just because I've been done dirty, it doesn't mean I have to return the favor. <laughs> we can model the difference. We can model the difference. I see a couple Can I take another question? I see Dr. Bakken has uh, um, uh, uh, posed a question. I will say, um, thank you, Dr. Bakken. Um, actually, and uh, uh, Dr. McCune, Dr. Halley, Professor Daly know that um, since this book has been released and folks have gotten a sense of the topic, um, uh, uh, Dr. Bakken wants to know, has there been I, as I glance at the question, has there been like a conflict in terms of disclosure? Um, yes, um, but I made the decision early on, first of all, to get consent, to respect people's anonymity. And I was less interested in outing people um, and more interested in uh, meaning the meanings that were generated from performances that mattered to people beyond the worship experiences that these men facilitated. Um, since releasing the book, there have been uh, notable artists who have self-disclosed their um, queerness um, uh, or their journey, their sexual history. Um, and they've done so not for me to publicize it, but in order to confirm um, perhaps the accuracy of the work um, and um, how they have experienced uh, the tensions in the work. And so when possible, I do try to infuse their insights with their permission. Um, I invite them to these um, Zooms just to give them a sense of how uh, their stories are being um, uh, explored. Um, but I, I made a, a decision early on that um, I didn't need it that bad. I didn't need the salacious nature that bad that I had to burn bridges. Um, and um, I wanted people to know uh, that though I as a Black woman have experienced exploitation, um, that there are ways in which the thickness of my intersectionality informs the decisions that I make and the contract that I make as a researcher um, and that it can be done. Uh, so yeah, I did make decisions and I do keep people in the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Um, I think that's all of our questions and it's about the right time to wrap up. This has been um, an extraordinary session. I'd like to thank Dr. Jones and all of the panelists and the musicians um, and remind people that next week, um, 
same time, same general place. Uh, we're going to be talking about teaching popular music and through the a discussion of a couple of new textbooks with Eric Cherry and Rebecca Rinsema. And so we hope people will join us for that. And again, just thank, oh, and people um, have been asking, and I want to let you know, um, Eric, um, I will put a recording of the session up on YouTube later on uh, with everybody's permission. So you can share it with other people who weren't able to make it today. And the chat session will also be saved, uh, at least for Dr. Jones and, and possibly for whoever in the panel or otherwise um, wants to share it with. It is a really nice document that we've had running on the side there. Um, so thank you everybody and I hope to see you again. Bye-bye.